Now you're on mute. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for the last speaker today, uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce Eric, um, who I came to know back at Princeton. Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, and part of the fun of this is to then think about um, uh, your background. So uh, Eric was born in Indiana, in the US. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree in biology from uh, University of Notre Dame, where I believe that's where you first encountered flies by making fly food. PhD at Yale University, where uh, Eric trained with Don Polson and then Walter Gehring. These are two legendary fly biologists. So Eric really comes from an amazing um, lineage. In uh, Walter's lab, uh, Eric did a series of lineage studies, which really the first studies I think I read of yours. And it was at that time that Eric began to think about embryogenesis in terms of broad patterning, began to learn how to score these patterns and so on, I think really began to think about it. And I have to say um, of the many talents of Eric, just really thinking about and looking at, looking at the embryos and the larvae is probably one of his great strengths. Um, and shortly before starting a postdoc with Rolf Nottinger in Zurich um, is when Eric first met Janine Nusslein Volhart, uh, which I would say began one of the one of science's truly great partnerships. Um, his first job was in Heidelberg uh, in Germany in 1978, where he and Yanni did a saturation screen for zygotic genes required to build the fly embryo, known as the Heidelberg screen. And what's amazing about this is it has its own wiki page. So the screen was the culmination of, uh, I would say, a long arc of fly scientists, Drosophila scientists, who really used classical genetics, genetics to um, take apart development. So we're talking about um, from T.H. Morgan to Don Polson to Ed Lewis and so on. So Eric really sits in that space, um, this long arc of just amazing fly geneticists. And furthermore, after that original screen, he and Trudy Schupach, his wife and, and an elite fly biologist in her own right, um, also did a series of screens for the maternal genes to sort of complete that natural set of genes that are required to make the young embryo. And these screens really revolutionized developmental biology. I should say in the pantheon of Nobel prizes, that would the Kagan ranking of, of Nobel prizes, this would rank very high. So get a high score in that. So um, Eric shared the 1995 Nobel Prize with Ed Lewis and, and Yanni for quote, the discovery is concerning the genetic control of early embryonic development. And um, this really these screens are where we get to say to our colleagues, yeah, yeah, that was found in flies over and over and over again. These genes really came out of those. So 1981, uh, Eric moved to Princeton uh, with, with Trudy. Um, I met him a few years later. He was very graceful and gracious. Uh, in my time there. Um, he further built on his work. Um, and I think, and now what's really interesting is um, his genetics uh, prowess is now he has added physics and a lot of other serious uh, sciences to the problem of gastrulation is what he's really focused on. And his work, if I were to classify it, I would say it's always very visual. Um, and he really takes a problem has a clear vision of where he wants to go with it. And he walks that road, which I, I'm always very impressed with. Um, Eric, uh, really a great person. He does his science with a graceful style. But uh, I think what most of us really like about Eric is he's absolutely inspirational in his passion for doing the science above the trappings of science. And I remember being warned about getting sucked into the trappings of science, which of course I ignored, um, maybe not to my benefit. Um, he truly loves flies, loves bench work. I don't know, Eric, if you're still doing bench work, but you were when I was there, and I suspect you still are. And um, Eric has been a very strong advocate for the importance of basic research discoveries as really the engine that drives scientific progress forward. And for all of those reasons, uh, I, and I think we are really grateful to have you here, Eric, to give us up, to show us what you're working on. So again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Ross, for that uh, really wonderful introduction. What I'm going to do, I guess I first, I'm going to share, see if I can share, all right, 
and then go to how do I get into this is presentation mode am I sharing already yes you are okay and now we're now we're great okay yes <laughs> all right <laughs> okay so um given the nature of this meeting what I thought I would what I thought I would do was to begin by actually a little bit of a discussion of, of how one goes about choosing research projects in science and, and in particular how one chooses a, a research organism a particular phenomena that allows you to to best address particular questions in science and what this is going to be of course then is going to involve a little bit of, of personal history. And, and I think that's true because for all of us who are serious about doing science, the thing that's really crucial is that you find a problem that somehow corresponds to your particular interests, to your particular talents, to the way that you see things. The, Science is hard. You have to spend a lot of time in the lab, and it it's helps if there is a kind of a personal drive behind the particular projects that you're interested in. For me, one of the great transformative experiences as a scientist was came when I was a young student, when I saw embryos for the first time in laboratories. And these were actually initially sea urchin embryos and frog embryos, and eventually basically fly embryos. And I think for all of us who've seen or thought about embryonic development, one of the, and I'm going to play these movies just simultaneously, it's a, uh, a, a remarkable thing how an embryo starts from apparently a single simple single cell and then divides and undergoes these extraordinary morphological transformations that ultimately yield the functional organisms like frogs or fish or flies or or, or even us humans in our own bodies and if you and even at the time although i was mostly struck by the, the sort of visual impact. If you look at cells, uh, the questions and look at embryos, the questions that automatically occur to you are questions of how is this simple cell shape? How is how are embryos shaped? How does form arise? And so you look, you can see folds in the sheet of cells. How do, cell, how do folds form? How do cells move? And then even more specifically, why is it in an embryo that some cells form folds and others don't? Why, why do folds or cells move in specific areas? And, and in like everything in life, these questions ultimately depend on genes and reflect gene activities. And so, the idea and one of the things that's driven my own migration from frogs and sea urchins to flies has been the, the obvious realization that knowing the genes is going to help. And knowing the genes is going to, even, not just knowing the genes, but they will give us powerful tools for understanding any process that you're interested in. I think this meeting has been extraordinary in the range of different topics that one can use Drosophila and the genetic knowledge to understand and begin to approach biological questions. And so uh, from the standpoint of embryonic development, as Ross mentioned, one of the, the, the critical things for understanding embryonic development is the realization that embryos get gene products from two sources. They're going to get gene products, RNAs and proteins that are already present in the unfertilized egg and supplied by the mom, the mother, and then other RNAs and proteins 
that the embryo is going to make itself through its own transcription. And we can think of this process then as kind of an input into the system, an input that rely that's present in the unfertilized egg, and an output, which is in terms of transcription and behaviors in the embryo. What is wonderful from the standpoint of uh, genetics and genetic analyses is that this is, although the idea of inputs and outputs, stimulus and response are common features to almost all biology, what is special and, and I think spectacular about early embryos is the idea that the inputs and the outputs depend on different genotypes. That the inputs are set up in the unfertilized egg by the mother, and the outputs are a zygotic genotype, or depend on gene activity in the embryo. And that means from a mutational or genetic standpoint, if we're going to identify genes, the mutational criteria that we use to identify genes, the strategies that we use in mutagenesis experiments are gonna be different and you can immediately from the onset of the process, identify and distinguish input, initial input from output. And as Ross mentioned, um, one of the uh, critical first experiments in my own career, but I think also in general in Drosophila was a, a set of mutagenesis screens that use that idea to identify, to distinguish inputs and outputs to determine, to identify genes that are active in the mother and in the embryo. And these were screens that I began now a long, long time ago. 40, 40 years that I, I found this picture. There's one of the few pictures where I and Jana, the, the major participants, I believe, I, Jana Sava, Trudy Schipach, and uh, Christiana Nusleiter are in the same photograph at the same time. Um, uh, Trudy and uh, Jani and I did extensive screens for the embryo input. Uh, Jana did dominant maternal effect screens that have been very useful for a whole variety of different processes. Trudy and Yanni went on and did uh, screens for maternal effect mutants. The critical idea when we talk about screens in flies is that what one does since flies are diploid is one randomly mutagenizes flies and then establishes inbred lines, carries them through a number of generations until one establishes, reestablishes homozygous individuals that are present in any individual line. Normally in these screens, we set up from somewhere between 20,000 and 40,000 different lines. And then the interesting thing is that to distinguish between maternal and zygotic components uh, is really the basically the behavior of this vinyl, the, the, the homozygotes that are produced in these screens. If the homozygotes die, and if they die as embryos, the screen identifies genes that are critical for embryonic development, are therefore outputs. Uh, if screens uh, allow these, these females to survive, uh, individuals to survive because females to be sterile, uh, these genes are essential for female fertility and are um, defined maternal inputs. Now, these screens were done to an extent that we believe it was, we might as well stop doing them that we had identified most of the genes involved in these processes. And uh, I'm having trouble escape. I, um, for some reason, my PowerPoint has frozen. I'm not advancing. Try the arrows on the on the left. Ah, the and it left worked. Left Finally, yes. And so what I'm going to do, so this, this talk is actually going to start out fairly general, and then it's going to shift in to use those general ideas for some very specific analyses. Uh, if I look back at those screens and say, what are the, the their major contribution, in addition to just generating the, or identifying the the genes and the relevant tools that many of us have used in subsequent 
studies, there's some certain general important ideas that have emerged. And one of the critical ones is the relative roles of maternal versus zygotic genes in early development. There are about 13,000 genes in flies. And if you look at early embryos, about 7,000 of them at least are expressed as RNAs. And what one has learned from the screens is that the vast, vast, vast majority of all of the RNAs, proteins that are needed by the embryo are supplied by the mother in the unfertilized egg. Most of these, and this includes ribosomal components, everything required for transcription, for the cell cycle, so that everything that you see or that cells need to do are supplied by the mother in some form in the early embryo. And the other feature is that they are uniformly distributed such that all of the cells in the embryo have all of these capacities. The, there are, however, among the maternal contributions, relatively rare maternal transcripts or proteins that are localized in specific regions of the egg. <clears throat> and these provide positional information to the cells that form in the embryo instructing them for what they're going to do. So there are a small number of these. In general, though, when we think about maternal components, it'll be important to think that almost everything that we see is supplied maternally and defines behaviors that are available to all cells. I'm having... I don't understand what my problems are here with advancing. I'm going to escape for a moment, or can I? If you press the, the arrows at the I'm bottom. I'm pressing the arrows. This is okay. interesting. And, and it doesn't work. And nothing seems to work. It's as though, um, ah. ah, there you go. Every once in a while, there's a magic press that I do. <laughs> Something wonderful happens, and we advance. And so, the, uh, so there are a small number, about 150 genes, which are required early in the embryo for either defining cell shape, uh, cell, cell fates, or defining morphological trans transformations. And the, the striking feature of those rare genes, they're rare, and one can ask, why is it that the embryo, if the embryo, if the mother can supply almost all genes to the embryo, what's the special feature of these of zygotic transcription? What does zygotic transcription supply? And it supplies, if one looks at these genes, virtually all of them are expressed in very tightly defined temporal and spatial patterns. So genes are um, a gene. Is, and what transcription allows you to do is to make cells different from each other and set up specific cells into specific patterns. So uh, and most of these genes are either transcription factors or signaling molecules. I think, but I'm... Uh, is there a, I'm trying different types of of advancing strategies. <laughs> uh, actually, what I might try to do is, is can't even escape. Oh, okay. Uh, so now, so what? Um, uh, so now, um, what did? Oh, I'm back to the problem again. Uh, what I'd like to do is step back from that general view and, and return to the problem of morphology and how embryos change shape and try to think about that from a, 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 a cell biological uh, standpoint. The, what we're looking at in these figures here are cross-sections of Drosophila embryos. And 
what we're going to, uh, and looking at the, the panel on the far right, what we can see is that this, I am really, Eddie, yeah. Eddie. Just a second. You know, go with your arrow on the on the slide. No, put put the full presentation. Full as presentation. You it, the full uh -huh. presentation. Uh, okay. No, from the one. No, we're going to full presentation. Let me see. I think you are not choosing the right arrows with this with the cursor. There, go there. Okay. And now, if you go to the bottom left, you see those arrows there next to a pen and an edit box on the left. In oh these uh -huh. these ones yeah ah yeah. those are I'm, I've been using the ones on my desk on my desktop they should my... they should work but yeah mm -hmm. okay this yeah, is much uh, better Eric the only thing is that sometimes they disappear so you have to go with the pointer to the bottom and they will appear again okay I've got it I think I'm gonna look guys I think I'm gonna be able to do this okay now we're back into mode okay so given that basic genetic background which is actually unique to Drosophila in the detail that we have available, one can begin to, we, we turn to the question of morphogenesis and specifically what we would like to do is bridge the gap between uh, genes to mechanical, uh, cell biological uh, movements and property and even physical properties like force and movement. The specific event that we're going to talk about in the embryo is the invagination of the cells on the ventral side of the embryo that make this fold that will translate, um, that will move the future mesodermal cells, the cells that will make muscle, uh, into the interior of the embryo. And from the genetic screens, we've learned that there is, uh, that this process is set up by a maternal protein transcription factor called dorsal on the ventral side of the embryo that activates the expression of two key regulators called twist and snail. And it's the presence of those two genes, which are transcription factors and define mesodermal fate that drive the specific cell shape uh, changes that move mesoderm into the interior. Thank you, this is working much better now. And so when you can look at the process and that's what's remarkable for me is that these mesodermal cells move into the embryo with, uh, over an extraordinarily rapid 10 to 15 minute period. You can see the panel at the top where the embryo, we're looking at the ventral side of the blastoderm embryo. And you can see that within minutes of when the, the blastoderm is finally formed, these cells specifically begin to change shape and move into the interior. And these are the cells that are going to form meso that will be mesoderm and will form muscle. Once the cells are inside the embryo, they undergo an interesting transition. They lose their epithelial quality and begin to spread out over the surface of the embryo such that they will eventually in a position where they will make uh, muscle. Now, I've chosen this 45 minute period, which is a relatively short time during, uh, uh, even during the entire embryonic development of Drosophila, in part because it contains two interesting examples of morphogenetic uh, events. On the one hand, for a 15 minute period, we have uh, the formation of this fold, on our, our internalization of cells. And this is again, a general property that one sees in all embryos from human embryos. The ability of epithelia to form folds is an important property and an important say during the development of the, the, the nervous system and the ability of tubes to form and close is obviously a critical issue. Uh, uh, it has a, a, a clinical importance. The, once the cells get on the inside, they undergo this transition from epithelial to active moving mesenchymal cells. And that transition, which is essentially an epithelial mesenchymal transition, is uh, something that one sees throughout the development of many organisms and also in, cl in, in clinical examples of uh, like metastasis during cancer. So 
one of the goals here is to try to use the fly embryo to understand these basic, you know, this the basic underlying cell biology, how one makes folds physically, how one transitions, what is it that controls the timing of these events. And what I'm going to do in the next 15, uh, 20 minutes is discuss and describe to you some of our work on folding and how our force is generated to fold, uh, that, um, that drive the formation of folds in tissues. And then in the second uh, part, uh, the second half of this uh, second part, what I'm going to ask is a more specific question. How is it when one looks at a process in development where there's a sequence of morphological changes, the cells, uh, first they form a fold, the fold internalizes cells, and only when the cells are internalized do the cells undergo, uh, to begin to detach from each other and undergo an uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition and um, begin to uh, divide and spread out over the surface of the embryo. So what we'd like to know here is how is it that sequences of events are controlled in developmental biology? Uh, how is it the time spans over which we're working uh, are basically consistent with maybe only one or two rounds of gene expression. So how is it mechanically that one controls a sequence of events, uh, particularly what you obviously want, you don't want the cells to detach from each other and begin to spread before they're internalized. If they were to detach, uh, the, the, the attachment of epithelial cells to each other is a requirement to be able to make folds or to first, first and so how does the how do how do folds uh the, the the sequencing is important but to understand the sequencing one has to also understand what are the mechanical forces involved in uh epithelial folding what we've what we're looking at here, if we can look at the process again you can see uh on the ventral side of the embryo, how the fold happens. Each of these panels is about four cell, four to five minutes apart. One can see that uh, initially the cells are very tall columnar cells. They all have the same shape. But as the process begins, these cells that are going to internalize uh, become longer and thicker, more trapezoidal in nature. Actually, what's happening is that the apices of the cells are constricting. They constrict the volumes we know remain constant, the cells elongate, and then they shorten and they turn into this extreme trapezoid, trapezoidal shape. So we, would, uh, we can take this fold and translate it into a sequence of cell shape changes that seem to involve this specific constriction of the apical surface of individual cells. When looks using various molecular markers, one of the telling events for us was that at the end of cellularization, most of the myosin was the distribution of the protein myosin. Myosin is a contractile protein that will generate uh, force on the actin cytoskeleton. At the end of the formation of the cellular blastoderm, most of the myosin is at the base of the cells, would be right up here. And that as the process begins, one can begin to see an accumulation of myosin apically, and if you put a contractile uh, uh, force here on the apical surface of the cells, you can easily imagine that that localization of this myosin here is what's driving the apical constriction and the cell shape change. Now, if we go back and look at the genetics. We know we've learned quite a bit about how myosin comes to be activated and localized into this ventral furrow. We know that upstream are the two major regulators of mesoderm, twist and snail, and they activate a set of, uh, they are transcription factors and activate the transcription of a set of downstream regulators that govern myosin. The interesting feature about this way these proteins govern myosin is by activating the 
phosphorylation through a, a, a pathway, a well-defined pathway, rho kinase, that ultimately drives myosin contractility and the formation of the furrow. You can see in this image, myosin beginning to accumulate on the surface, becoming contractile, and then driving the furrow. If we step back a second and we look at these genes, one of the interesting features, and this is, I think, important for almost a lot of the work that we do with Drosophila, is that um, many of the genes that we identify in Drosophila are easily identified and have homologs in humans. Uh, and uh, this includes the twist and snail gene, as I'll talk about later, but also almost all the genes in this rho myosin dependent myosin contractility pathway. What's interesting to us, and this has emerged consistently through much of our work, is that when you do genetics and identify genes, we've also identified genes like folded gastrulation, T48, or, or MIS that are where the human homologs are hard to identify. This means either that these genes are novel solutions to activating the myosin uh, uh, contractility pathway, or it means that some features, the functional features of these genes can be maintained even if their amino acid uh, sequences aren't maintained. So downstream again though, the process is exactly the same. Upstream the process is also uh, has certain similarities. So we believe that understanding how this pathway works will be informative about the general underlying uh, biology of all uh, of self-shaped changes in all organisms. One of the things that surprised us though, when we looked more closely at the distribution of myosin in these cells was that we, I actually expected myosin to be at somewhere on the surface of cells, outline the surface of individual cells as rings that you can see the outlines of cells. That you, and I expected to see myosin rings which would contract and change the shapes of cells. But instead, when one looks at how this myosin accumulates in these embryos, what one sees is that instead of rings of myosin in individual cells, what one establishes is this green network of myosin that spreads across the whole uh, surface of the mesoderm. And it's this, the contraction of the network, rather than our in addition to, or in some way in, uh, in parallel with the contraction of myosin in individual cells that actually drives the formation of the furrow. We know one of the features of the furrow is that as myosin accumulates, uh, you can use, uh, we can use, a, a, we can show that the tension, the physical tension on the surface of these cells, the contraction drives a physical tension that we can follow by the accumulation of various uh, tension sensors like the ajuba protein. We can also demonstrate the tension that's in these cells through by, by doing uh, laser ablations that allow us to follow the shapes, uh, that allow us to follow the, the accumulation of tension that drives the, uh, the, the shape changes in these cells. A second interesting and useful feature for us in following the behaviors of individual cells was that if you can follow here in this red and green panel where we're looking at the surface of a small region of the mesoderm, in individual cells, you will, although this is a network of green interconnected actin and myosin, in individual cells, myosin accumulates and goes away, accumulates and goes away, as though the whole system is a pulsing system of myosin. The pulses in individual cells can be measured. They occur with about a, a 90 second periodicity. Importantly, they're asynchronous from each other. So all of the cells are pulsing, but they're pulsing in um, uh, different frequencies. We can follow though what happens in individual cells by following a cumulative pulse of myosin over a 
45 second interval perhaps, and follow the shape of the cells. As myosin begins to accumulate in cells, what one sees is that the myosin puts stress on the surface of the cells and the cell is distorted. And when myosin is lost in this cell, the cell regains its original, original polygonal shape. So we're constricting here and then relaxing. But the polygon here is smaller than the polygon here. So the constriction of the apical surface of the cell occurs in steps. And these of myosin contractility and relaxation. So each of the cells is undergoing this process. Uh, we thought a lot about why it, why it, you know, why biology is like this. It turns out that after we had observed this pulsing in myosin, many other, uh, the same type of myosin pulsations were observed in, across the animal kingdom. Myosin generally seems to work this way in steps of contraction and then relaxation. An interesting problem is why when myosin, uh, it's easy to see why myosin contraction would re reduce the, the area. Well, when myosin goes away, why does the cell not restore its original shape, and then, so there has to, it tells us there has to be other additional mechanisms uh, that would maintain the cell in its shape. What for us though has been a useful feature of this pulsing of myosin in the embryo, uh, in the ventral furrow, is that we can see myosin. We can see it, we can record the pulses, and we can record what cells do. And I've just shown you that the shape, the apical surface of the cell also undergoes cell shape changes, which are pulsed, and they're pulsed in coordination with the apical, uh, with the surface change, with the uh, uh, myosin pulses. Uh, one of the remarkable things we found is that every, uh, feature that we've looked at from nuclear position, nuclear movement, increase in surface area, the various, any aspect of these early cell shape changes that we can see that we might have thought depended on microtubules or on other systems shows the same pulsing rate. It shows a, a coordinated stepwise morphological transition that is characteristic uh, that is governed by the rate of, of myosin pulsation. So now what we've come to, uh, come to uh, begin to think is that probably the major morphogenetic motor for almost all of early development is this cytoplasmic mo uh, motility or the cytoplasmic uh, contractility of myosin and the various inputs in the outside the ventral for everywhere in the embryo will depend on myosin accumulations and the, and the resultant stress. So one of the, my current collaborations that I won't go into today has been collaborations with biophysicists to measure global myosin distributions across the whole surface of the embryo and try to build biophysical models or morphological change based simply on myosin accumulation. We don't think this is gonna be possible. We think we're likely to fail at some point, but that becomes the interesting thing in science to ask how far can we push a very simple model to explain things that are probably ultimately become more and more complicated. And so this pulsing of myosin has opened our eyes to a, a new experimental approach to thinking about the processes. What I'd really like to do though in the last 10 minutes that is talk a little bit more about this second transition, this epithelial mesenchymal transition that also happens in um, mesodermal cells. Again, uh, it happens in response to the expression of twist and snail in the embryo that determines these cells to be mesoderm and drives the fold formation, but also drives then this epithelial mesenchymal transition. All the proteins that we're gonna be looking at are maternally supplied in uniform, 
throughout the embryo. So the question then becomes, how does the programming of expression of twist and snail in these mesodermal cells drive two different behaviors, formation of a fold, and then the detachment of these cells in uh, and, uh, a division and a, uh, a spreading behavior. Same genes are governing both of these behaviors, but they happen in sequence. Um, I think we can follow these behaviors. Now we're looking at fly embryos where we, I've, I've kind of dis dissected out, dissected the embryo. We're now looking inside the embryo at the ventral side of the embryo. We, we stain the cells. This is right after the cells have, are still epithelial and have moved into the interior of the embryo. And then we stain the cells with blue here. These are the same embryos so we can identify where the mesenchymal, where the we can follow the transition using scan EM of cells that move into the interior and then begin to spread out over the surface. And because we're using scanning EM for these processes, we can go to very high magnification and follow the morphologies of the cells as they undergo these epithelial uh, transitions. One of the things, uh, this uh, process that normally your epithelial you detach and do a cell division and then begin to spread. We've asked whether the division is important. And one of the interesting things about flies is we can, by manipulating the cell cycle, because uh, the cell cycles are controlled by a set of, of, of phosphatases called strings, we can eliminate all further divisions. And what we can, even though the cells norm, even though cell division is normally an essential part of this epithelial mesenchymal transition, we can eliminate that cell division and we can show that the cells undergo exactly the same kinds of, of junctions so that we can begin to tease apart what are the aspects of epithelial mil, uh, mesenchymal transitions that are essential for spreading what are uh, different. We know that this behavior depends on these programming the cells through these two transcription factors called twist snail. And what is interesting to us in this analysis is that twist and snail are both thought to be uh, major regulators of epithelial mesenchymal transitions. In almost all organisms where this process has been looked at, snail in particular plays a major role. And both of them not only play a major roles in epithelial mesenchymal transitions during normal development, but also in metastases in tumors. And that's just a, a, an array of, of papers that show that this process that is essential for normal development, the spreading behavior of cells, is also a process that is then elicited or occurs in certain tumors and drives uh, uh, metastasis, which is and so what I'd like to address then is uh, the snail expression that drives epithelial folding here, and we've seen also drives the um, EMT. How does the embryo ensure that the folding happens first? Now, one of our initial ideas is, well, maybe this is a uh, it's the same gene product, but maybe the gene comes to be expressed in uh, mesodermal cells. And initially, its low le and its levels accumulate, and low levels might drive uh, epithelial folding. And then as levels get higher and higher, they would drive an EMT. And to test that idea, we uh, this is Mo Wang's uh, work, characterized to follow the expression of uh, of snail, and we saw that yes, it does get higher and higher as you go through gastrulation. But what was surprising to us is that even at these very early stages where snail is being expressed, it at the early stages, it's not that early low expression drives epithelial folding because at early stages, the snail expression here begins to drive a disassembly 
of junctions already during cellularization in the ventral side of the embryo. You can see that here at time that uh, we're looking at uh, over a 15 minute period, uh, junctional proteins are high at the beginning and then towards the, and they begin to fall and are low. And then right at the end, right as the embryo begins to gastrulate, uh, adhesion proteins and epithelial character comes back. So what that tells us is that snail, which has this activity to drive the fold and to drive mesenchymal activity is actually trying to do both of those things during its initial expression periods. And you can, um, but what one sees is that the epithelial mesenchymal transition, which begins, that is junctions, adhesive junctions begin to come apart, that process is uh, correlated uh, uh, the, the process then is stopped or rescued because the junctions then begin to come back. And that junction come back actually simultaneously with the pulsing of myosin activity. We can again record the pulsing activity. And we can show that the junctions are restored and resume morphology in a stepwise fashion. And that suggests to us that in some way, and this was an unexpected idea about epithelial mesenchymal transitions, that myosin-induced tension blocks the ability of snail to induce uh, junction loss in mesodermal cells. The snail is doing two things, but uh, the junction loss that's essential for epithelial mesenchymal transition is trumped or dominated by tension induced by myosin activity. And to test that idea that whether snail express, whether uh, tension will block epithelial mesenchymal transitions, what Mo did was to develop an artificial system where she moved the cell shape behaviors and the behaviors that we're looking at to the ectoderm, the epithelial ectoderm, cells that normally don't express snail. So the first question she asked was, if one, using the power, using a, the, a GALFO UAS system, drives the expression of snail in the ectoderm as well, we know that if we don't, if you don't also express twist, these cells are not uh, transformed into ectoderm are not transformed into mesoderm. But the one thing that happens if you express snail in these cells is that the expression of snail in the ectoderm here drives the loss of all the epithelial junctions and causes uh, ecadherin and, and, and beta-catinin to now be localized along the surfaces of cells. So snail in the ec expression in the ectoderm is able to drive um, junction loss, which will also notice that it doesn't occur. The one place where ectopic snail doesn't drive junction loss is in the mesoderm, because it's in these cells where twist and snail working together are driving um, myosin contractility. And, and therefore, in our model, the tension that's driven here will uh, allow or stabilize these junctions. To test that idea, what Mo did next was to, in addition to it expressing ectopic snail everywhere in the ectoderm, also expressed ectopic folded gastrulation. I introduced folded gastrulation to you earlier. It's the gene which actually drives myosin contractility in the embryo. And if one simultaneously drives myosin contractility, uh, uh, it drives snail expression, which is going to drive an EMT, but myosin contractility, what one sees is that one restores the uh, morphology and the localization of the junctions. So what that suggests is that it's the accumulation of myosin in the mesoderm that blocks EMT. And 
it's that accumulation that provides an, a, a timer. So as long as you have myosin accumulating, the cells will be able to undergo their cell shape change. But the moment myosin goes away in the mesoderm, the uh, mesodermal cells also will lose their junctions and begin to spread. So but that points out two interesting um, uh, aspects of the, of the, the, the uh, model. Uh, to, the first is a, uh, about timing here in that the sensitivity to timing, we're arguing, is what controls the timing of sensitivity to tension is what controls the timing of EMT. And this gives you then mechanically without changing or involving elaborate circuits of gene activity to control one event, sequence one event, uh, mechanical epithelial events versus uh, ep ep epithelial transitions through the, pro the properties of the cells. The second idea, and one that we're actually beginning to, to follow up on more in the lab, and I know Mo is beginning to work on this in our own lab, is what is the nature? Why is it that uh, if it's true that uh, tension is able to block uh, snail-driven EMTs, what is it about tension? And is this a property that's observed only in fly embryos, or is it a property that's generally observed and is potentially applicable to thinking about other epithelial and mesenchymal transitions in the, in the embryo, or not only in, in the fly embryo, but in human embryos, invertebrate embryos, as well as clinical conditions like cancer. So we think that this idea of tension gives us a new handle on epithelial uh, mesenchymal transitions and therefore potentially on metastases in cancer. So I'm going to stop there. I'd like to uh, just acknowledge, uh, in thinking about this, that one of the great things for me in doing my own science has been the wonderful collaborations that I've had and past uh, collaborations that were important were obviously the ones involved in the mutagenesis experiments, Christian Musain Bohart, Trudy Schupak, and Janusz Sneba. Also, though, collaborations with the biophysicists and the uh, Sigler Institute, the uh, Princeton, Matthias Kashuba, Michael Gelbart, Olaf Polyaka, but particularly the wonderful set of postdocs who worked with me on, on gas relation, uh, Adam Martin, Bing Hay, Konstantin Dubovinsky, Rachel uh, Huang and, and Mo Wang. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, if we have time, take take questions. Do I? Um, okay. How yes. do we do this? Do I do I take questions or? Uh, yes, yes, please, please. So thank you very much. That was an amazing talk. Really nice pictures, and it really shows when you ask the right questions is the only way you can go forward and move forward and understand more about biological processes. So thank you very much for your time. And Hamid has a question for you, which is as actually a couple of questions. One is a more specific one, and the second one is a more general one. So the first one is that, are there any roles for acting cytoskeleton in these shape changes? Okay, so uh, uh, yes. And, and I could have actually always said actin, uh, actomyosin cytoskeleton, obviously, Myosin produces force on and tension on cells through its interactions with the actin cytoskeleton and the coupling of the actin cytoskeleton to junctions and to cell surface proteins. So, you when we myosin, we believe is the major regulatory component here in producing contractile uh, that produces the contractile, it produces the stress or the uh, the that drive cell shape change. It is clear though, and something that we, uh, is the assembly of the actin cytoskeleton, the position of the actin cytoskeleton and its association with junctions is something that changes over time and has to provide the, the background or that has to provide the fundamental structures to be able to, to allow myosins or these networks of myosin to produce force on the whole embryo. So let me, before going into the general one, let me ask you another question is that, how much is known about the role of the neighboring cells 
because you know ah. it's a tissue they are connected yeah. so whatever happens no, no, of course <laughs> yeah it's 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 a um exciting area and you, there's, there's two ways of, of that we've approached this one is to try to since we record the behaviors of all the cells what we've tried to do in, in this pulsing behavior say if a single cell pulses is there are we had initially thought that that pulsing might induce pulsing and in there would be waves of a cell contraction we don't see anything that organized overall we see in general an independence of cells however if you look very closely i think adam martin has a beautiful set of papers where he's shown a, a shown there's an impact that cells don't exist in in isolation and um so that's on a local cell level the other question is we have a group of a, a 800 cells on the ventral side of the embryo that are mesoderm and are doing this and contracting and they must be exerting forces on the remainder of the embryo for two and, and what one sees is obviously those cells move we um we've measured these cells now what what we know is that in response to the internalization of mesoderm mesodermal cells moving into the interior all the remaining cells on the surface of the ectoderm become stretched by about uh, 20 to 25 percent they remain they maintain constant volumes and they um their surface they become shorter and their surfaces become bigger and they maintain the continuous surface of the embryo so a simple way of thinking about this and this is the way i still favor is that this is a passive response of the surrounding cells to the stress induced by mesoderm and endoderm mm -hmm. there's only one observation that's beginning to argue against that this is an experiment which i've done which is has been late one of my own laboratory experiments and that is to use maternal effect mutants to generate embryos where you flattened all of the maternal gradients and made cells establish an embryo that's only composed of mesoderm at a particular point along the anterior or only composed of ectoderm or only composed of posterior midgut cells so you basically you can imagine by altering the maternal gradients one establishes a uniform blastoderm where all the cells are trying to do the same thing when you do that with mesoderm all the cells try to contract that's okay and the embryo has trouble because it, it, it's, mm -hmm. if you do that with ectoderm this is the observation that i don't understand i thought that if ectoderm was just totally passive it would just sit there forever and not do anything what actually happens is that the ectodermal cells at the time when gastrulation would begin or would be happening the ectodermal cells on their own become shorter and become maintain constant volume and become wider and what that does is it crinkles up the whole surface of the embryo thrown into tiny little mini folds and so what it suggests to me that is that my idea is wrong about passive responses in ectoderm mm -hmm. and that the ectoderm may be undergoing a coordinated self shape change that is uh, that allows it to spread that it's not just that the cells spread passively but that they're also programmed to do that. i haven't figured out how to test that idea yet this is really one of the things that i'm doing that i that i personally am doing at the bench and i haven't figured out quite how to how to do it yet but i'm now balancing the old view and the new view mm -hmm. about passive versus active ectodermal responses okay thank you so just uh, the last uh, specific questions and then we will let hamid to ask you broader question so the specific question is from christos which i think is a, is a, is a good one and he asked, are there a minimum number of cells that can invaginate? Ah, I think, um, I don't know the answer. I know that the way that people have um, 
that can approach that we know that with optogenetic manipulations that we can make small spots of cells which will activate the rho kinase and drive an apical constriction mm -hmm. so that is known mm -hmm. what is less well known is whether you can build an invagination what's required for an will it, a single cell i would suspect that a single cell that you induce to apical constrict the very most that it can do is detach and ingress into the interior so you clearly need a group of cells mm -hmm. to make a fold mm -hmm. and to make the kind of imagination mechanically that you see and there are groups right now that are really working on the biophysics of the geometry mm -hmm. of primordia and how that drives how that how you can drive specific folds i don't know if you make it very small, if you make the spot very small, whether you'll actually get internalization. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 that's a great experiment. I, I think, I hope the people that are doing those optical, uh, up, up to genetic manipulation, they're probably, they're doing those things. I just don't know what the answer is. But that's an exciting place to be right now. Okay, thank you. And now, um, Hamid, would you like to ask the question? I don't know yeah. whether I can unmute. Are you unmute? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm unmuted. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Right. Thank you so much for the for the talk, Eric. That was really fascinating and really awesome. So my question is: You've been part of the system for for several years now. So can you predict, or what was your prediction about Drosophila research in twenty years, in thirty years? Uh, so what what do you think your prediction is? It's uh, yeah. a good question. Um, but I you think. Yeah. So my sense is that uh, there are many powerful technologies that have been developed. Mm. Unmute. All right. There are many powerful. Sorry. Thank you. Now, right. sorry, sorry, Eric. I just wanted to mute everyone because there was lots of noise, and I am I mute you. Sorry, you are okay now. Now I'm okay. Okay, yeah. so uh, you know, CRISPR, lots of different ways uh, that have broadened the, the various organisms that we can work with. I think it's still true that almost uh, that what 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 the, the the big difference between working with Drosophila and working with all the other uh, possible organisms that might have offer specific advantages for studying specific phenomena is that um, for every one of those organisms, experiments are very hard. They're very difficult to be efficient, very difficult to be effective. And uh, what this means is that you can build insights, but it's very hard to go deep. It's very hard to get to uh, uh, to mechan to the, the problem of mechanism, the problem of organization of the cytoskeleton, the problem of epithelial mesonyme transitions are so difficult and so complicated that you need, I think we will always need an organism, a prime organism that allows you, that brings all the advantages and all the efficiencies for looking at these basic biological questions. And then you build from that primary organism, which I think should be Drosophila, out to looking at specific cases, specific clinical cases, but also phenomena in other animals that are analogous to, 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 to humans. I think, so I think that's one reason why uh, Drosophila will continue to be, um, to be a major focus in for almost all basic biological research, just that everything is so easy, or so easy, or it is so it is uniquely possible to get to the level where questions are where, where we really don't know the end, where questions are really generalizable. The other thing that I think is true is that science always builds on past on previous science, and so. When I think of the Drosophila embryo, when I think when I was a, when I was a child, when I was young, I um, 
and was fascinated with embryos, the question seemed impossible. And that how would one ever understand anything about programming of cells? And a remarkable thing for me over the 40 years that I've been a scientist is that many of those questions that I thought were impossible and hard to do are now answered. And we know them. We know them for flies. And we know extraordinary details about the process in flies. So what that does is it opens up the fly embryo as an opportunity to study all of biology. Anything that happens in biology, versus if it's transcriptional control, if it's the structure of the nucleus, if it's junctional reorganization, any phenomena that happens in biology, you can be pretty sure you can find it in a fly embryo and you can find it well defined. So you're able to use the fly embryo. You could be not interested in embryonic development at all and only interested in junctions or only interested in trend DNA protein binding to DNA. And the fly embryo is probably still the best, most efficient place to do that, just because so many smart people have spent their lives developing and characterizing transcription factors in flies, or myosin in flies, or any of those things. So I, I've thought sometimes about working on another animal. I have thought that occasionally, and because you see wonderful things. And I, when I started off, I wanted to work on frogs. I wanted to work on fish and fortunately discovered fly embryos. But now, I, whenever I think about it, I see so much, I, the advantages of flies are just so great that for what I want to do, but the specific questions that I want to ask, I can't imagine trying to approach them in anything that's harder than flies. Okay, we, I think that we all agree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, thank you very much. I would like to thank again all the speakers and participants for this lovely session. Thanks, Emilio. I know that you are very busy, so taking your time to share your signs and your motivation with us, it's, you know, it's a bonus, it's a real bonus. So thank you very much. Just let me remind you that tomorrow we will be starting at 1 Ghana time instead of 1.30. Okay? So from now on, just in the evening, just think about all the questions and all the biology that you have seen during this session, and then we will have more of that tomorrow. So have a lovely evening. Goodbye. Goodbye. And remember Slack. You can carry on having discussions today or tomorrow morning, which people did. So it's good. Thank okay. you very much, Eric. That was okay. great. And, right. Tano and all the other speakers. Yeah, right. Thanks, okay. Paul. Thanks to everyone. Tano, everyone. So, so uh, now what do I to go yeah. to Slack? What do I do? What do I, okay. what do, I do? So if you go, let me put the link again and see whether it works for you. So Slack, I was in a lecture room, but I had to leave, that's why I'm sitting here. Yeah, so I did sign up for Slack, I'm not sure how, uh, so I can go to- I'm going no, to, I got to you. Let, let me, let me get, uh, copy the link, I'm just into it now, and then see whether it works straight away, or whether we need to do anything. Okay, that's the link, I'm gonna put it in the chat for everyone. Now, if you click that. So where do I click here? Let's see, I also have the link that was sent to me this morning. So do you see the chat uh, link I just put up there, finishing in 202102? You see that link in the chat? No, okay. <laughs> sorry. Let's see. Can you see the chat? Can you see the chat? You can no, I don't see the chart. Where, where should the chart be? The chat. So if you go either at the bottom of your screen uh -huh. or a chat in the chat, yes. Chat. So I will... Sorry. The chat. And chat. so now, uh, so now I've got printed. I said chart. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I was looking for a chart and I didn't see it. But pronunciation. I see My pronunciation. My <laughs> pronunciation. All right. Let me put it again. So now that it last text I just sent to everyone. Let's see. That's start with... uh, yeah. So I click on, I can let's see if I click, click on, on that. that. 
And now it says, sign into your workspace. Okay, so you sign. With uh, my work, what is my, what do I sign in as or how? So sign with, if you just write Rosafrica, Rosafrica. At, and then whatever the rest is. Whatever the, at slack.com. Correct. Let's see whether that works. Let's go one. Okay. And says so sign. He's telling me no, we couldn't find your workspace. I could try one other thing, which is if I go to the link that was sent me this morning. Yes, that would be the best. Yeah, maybe try that. Let's try that. All right. And we will. Now we got using Slack. Uh, nothing much happened. Handy links. Okay. <laughs> Using Slack, Slack. I clicked on the things that said join now. Yeah. It wasn't, and it didn't really do anything for me except, ah, it said here we now join, join your full name, and there must be a password or something. Is that possible? Uh, if I don't think I, I keep getting. Uh, I don't think we needed a password. Let me see. Did anyone needed a password to come in? Because I'm coming in as Rosa. Sophia, you are there. Yeah. Let me let me 